In 2001, when Sam Lake's snarling face was plastered on the one and only Max Payne, it truly changed the landscape of gaming forever. It was the first game to incorporate slow-mo bullet time effects, showing homage to the newly released Matrix movie as well as the classic John Woo Hong Kong action flicks. Now every time a shooter is released with a bullet time slow motion effect, it is deemed a Max Payne clone in some way or another, even coming full circle in the realm of inspirations when John Wu himself produced a game that is known as a Max Payne clone, when Max Payne was originally inspired by John Wu. Inspiration Inception. And I use the term clone as a basic descriptor. I don't think games being clones are inherently a bad thing. I made a whole video on Dante's Inferno discussing that idea a long time ago. You, you don't need to go watch that, trust me. But it was only a year after Max Payne was released onto the world that perhaps the most blatant Max Payne clone was released. Titled like a true 80s action movie, Dead to Rights. A game that I adored back in 2002, but as I like to do on my channel, let's jump back 21 years and take a look and see if this game was really that good or is it all just nostalgia? This is Slate, I'm on it. <laughs> In an effort to not repeat myself in regards to the Max Payne comparisons throughout this entire video, I'm just going to run through a few that stand out among the crowd. The game is a neo-noir third-person shooter, taking place in a gritty urban landscape run by corruption starting at local mob bosses and rising up to the mayor of each respective city. Each game starts with a monologue from the protagonist about how much of a hellhole their city is. In both games, you play as a hard-boiled detective that suffers traumatic family deaths very early in the game that not only drives the character to seek out vengeance and justice but also untangles several layers of conspiracy as well. There are femme fatale characters at certain points in each game and of course both games involve slow motion diving around while firing a wide array of bullet delivery devices. To quickly mention some aspects in Dead to Rights that Max Payne doesn't have, cool disarm moves, auto targeted shooting, fisty cuffs, interesting mini games and dog. Jack Slate is the main protagonist of Dead to Rights. He is a police officer in Grant City, the so-called toughest place on earth. At Jack's side is his trusty canine companion named Shadow, who is just as ruthless as Jack when it comes to taking down bad guys. While on patrol, Jack responds to a call at a construction site, where he rams his cruiser through the front gate and immediately starts to take fire from construction workers, so something fishy's going on off the jump. After gunning down every construction worker in a 10 mile radius, he comes across a body on the job site, a gunshot victim that hits a little close to home, his father. As the chief shows up, he tries to send Jack home, but obviously he isn't going to let the person who shot his father get away with it, so he decides instead he's going to hunt down that person who is responsible. His first person of interest is the local crime boss named Augie Blatz, so that's where he heads to. Jack goes off on these tangents periodically throughout the game, and the writing of the dialogue really makes this game something special because sometimes I don't know how serious you're supposed to take this game. Like Max Payne was cut and dry. This is tragic and depressing and bad, but Dead to Rights is downright goofy sometimes, even when discussing the serious moments. Like right after leaving to avenge his dad, he talks about how he's gonna do something real stupid. He also tosses away his gun for whatever reason, like I think he's gonna need that, but the sound effect that happens when he does this is just the icing on the cake. Justice may not be smart, but it should be honest. I was about to do something real stupid. It's marvelous, and the whole game has this campy charm to it that I just absolutely adored. But before we discuss the story of this game, let's break down something that I didn't adore all that much. The gameplay. Look at this, fellas. All bleeding hero. <laughs> While the writing and the voice acting is a charming product of its time, the gameplay and controls unfortunately are too a product of their time, and console-based shooters in the early 2000s aren't typically the best games in existence. Most of the game is harmless, but a few things like inverted camera controls and funky targeting mechanics really become aggravating at several points in the game. The game is broken down into three primary aspects of gameplay, shooting, fighting, and mini-gaming. Shooting is obviously the biggest 
biggest thing in this game. This is through and through a spray and pray shooter. And for the most part, it's a damn good time. The game uses a lock on targeting system for shooting with options to zoom in and free aim if you really wanted to, but it's something that I never really used in the game. The reticle changes color depending on how good of a shot you have on that particular enemy, taking into account how far away they are, which weapon you're using, and if they're behind cover or not. With red being a sure hit, yellow being a high chance, and green being a likely miss. And once it turns blue, it means that that tough guy is dead to right. You lock onto enemies and blast away until they aren't standing to fight back. You can hot swap between targets really smoothly as you run around, but also as you take cover and dive. The cover based shooting is another thing that I rarely used in this game. It would come in handy in a pinch, but most of the time diving around was really the way to go. When you're locked on and enter a dive, you go into bullet time, slowing time down and allowing you to unload on every beating heart standing in your way, hot swapping between them all as you gracefully swan dive to the pavement. The alternative to taking cover when it comes to dodging incoming fire is to use human shields. You can grab lowly thugs and walk around with them and use them as meat shields to your heart's desire. This functions a lot like the Punisher game where you can use the person until they die or everyone firing at you dies at which point you kindly thank them for their service with a bullet. Grabbing enemies while unarmed also initiates a cool disarm move with several being unlocked throughout the game, changing animations depending on the type of weapon you're disarming and they are stylish at executions that you can do while casually stealing their weapon. You can also quickly deploy your dog Shadow at enemies as well to kill them instantly with the added bonus of the good boy bringing back their weapon to you. While I use this mechanic a lot, Shadow having the same animation and single attack move left me wanting more from having a badass dog sidekick. It pretty much functions as a free kill button on a cooldown, but there is a cheat code that allows you to spam it non-stop which was pretty cool too. This type of gameplay comes off easy at first, just locking onto enemies and blasting away with many options at your fingertips to replenish your guns and ammunition, but it gets exceptionally more difficult as the game goes on, with tougher enemies and more of them. There is a decent variety of weapons in the game from pistols to SMGs, rifles and shotguns and even some cooler things like rocket launchers thrown in for some good fun, but as most of the games of this era go, you tend to float around your favorites, which in my case were the rifles and the gnarly shotguns, especially the automatic one that you get in later levels. Unfortunately, weapon choice is not up to you at all times, as you simply just pick up whatever weapon the enemies have and once Jack depletes all the ammo of that particular gun, he just tosses it away, so if another baddie doesn't show up with that same weapon, there is no way to get it back. This provided a sort of forced variety to the gunplay that I can't really say that I was too mad at. It made the game feel fast paced and in the moments, just picking up whatever was available and squeezing the trigger until it clicks, and then ripping another gun from a poor henchman's hand or getting your dog to do it and then moving on with your business. One mechanic in the game that I liked a lot at the beginning was the option to toss an explosive canister of some kind into a group of enemies, or just one unlucky chap and auto-target it as it falls, creating a beautiful explosion. Once you start to get overrun by faster moving and more powerful enemies in later stages of the game though, you'll end up getting shredded by gunfire before you have time to toss it and shoot it, so it fell out of favor real quick in that regard. All in all though, the gunplay was a lot of fun, and since it is the primary thing that you'll be doing, I have little to complain about. Unfortunately in this game, there is also sections with forced unarmed combat, and to be blunt, it's just not what I'm here for. Fortunately, it's fairly simple and offers a change of pace from constant flying lead, but there are plenty of other things that suffice better in that regard, like the mini games and boss fights, but we'll get to those in a moment. The fighting is essentially just a mixture of smashing the punch and kick buttons into a couple different combinations, but no directional movements or crazy special moves, just mashing the buttons and blocking here and there. The enemies come on just as heavy in unarmed sections as they do in the rest of the game, but instead of slow motion dives and taking hostages you're instead required to just block their attacks just to make it out alive. And blocking drains the same meter that you use for the dive move and the gunplay, so once it runs out, you're kind of shit out of luck. You can also grab enemies and toss them around, but I don't even know if that does any damage to them, and it's often riskier going for that move instead of just punching them in the face. Shadow is also not with you in these moments in the game either, so there isn't even the option of a free kill button to lighten the load a little bit. Luckily, hand-to-hand -hand combat is a small percentage of the game. The prison level is probably the most prominent level where you don't have any weapons, I guess for obvious reasons, but most other levels give you some kind of firepower after only a couple fights here and there. 
One of the other main aspects of the gameplay comes in the form of mini games. These are usually brief little puzzles that come about here and there, like picking locks by locking cylinders at the right moments to line them all up. But there are also ones that take a bigger role in the levels. In the second mission of the game, you start off by playing as a stripper on stage pole dancing as a distraction for Jack to sneak through the club unnoticed. And while this may seem like a minor little side game, there are three whole waves of button presses that you have to do. This scene is a solid five minutes of original Xbox graphic glory, and trust every nine-year-old with a controller replayed this level many times over. Totally not speaking from experience though, I was a mature 10 years old when this game came out. There's also a level solely focused around disarming bombs found inside of a hotel building. You race against a countdown timer to guide a little ball through the circuit board on these explosives. It's like a game of operation as well because if you touch the sides then boom goes the dynamite. And the game doesn't just let you try the puzzle over again either. Back to the last checkpoint you go. This level was full of minigames actually. Getting to these bombs involves another type where you control Shadow as he sniffs out exactly where these explosives are in the building. This is really the only time that you control him and well it's pretty lackluster. Especially considering the first level taught you the basics of controlling Shadow so there was an implication that using him would be a bigger part of the game but this this was really it. And after you disarm all the bombs in the same building, you then have to make your way around to random fires and hallways that you have to put out by finding fire extinguishers in supply closets. This whole level was just made to slow the game down, I think. There are a few other minigame puzzle type things thrown about in the game, but all of them are little more than just entertaining changes of pace to break up the non-stop action. And most of them were pleasant to see. Except the bombs, they went a little too far overboard in my opinion. There were way too many of them, and failing them was a big setback. Now that we've discussed the gameplay and the overall mechanics, let's see how it comes together with the fantastic writing and dialogue that this game had to offer. Jack Slate busts into a construction site. He got a distress call from dispatch and decided to respond as aggressively as possible. And good thing, his intuitions were correct. Crazy construction workers dropped their nail guns and picked up their bullet guns and Jack is quick to put them down. This level functions mostly as a tutorial for basic mechanics in the game, but once you reach the end of the construction site, Jack discovers a dead body that isn't one of the dozens that he shot himself. Nope, this one was his father, and someone murdered him in cold blood. The chief shows up to the scene and tries to send Jack home, but that's not gonna happen. He's gonna hit the streets and find out who did this. Suspect number one is Augie Blatz, a local crime boss who holds up at a strip club called the Den of Iniquity, a fantastic name. Jack's father was a detective on the force as well, and he was very interested in Augie's income source for his philanthropy. And while many in the underground know it's from drugs and racketeering, he he has the public eye fooled with his giving personality. Inside the club, Jack runs into Hildy. She was an assistant to Jack's father, but also for some extra cash, she dances at the Den of Iniquity. She asks Jack not to tell his dad about her being there, but he very cut and dry tells her that he's dead. I don't know why, but this line delivery was my favorite. You won't tell him, will you? It'd probably kill him. Yeah, don't worry about it. He's already dead. What? Jack tries to make his way to the back room to see Augie, and Hildy offers to distract the bouncers with her fantastic dance moves. The distraction doesn't do much good for clearing security, so Jack resorts to pulling the fire alarm and clearing the club of all the people, with just him left in the club with the staff, and it's time to throw down. After fighting some staff members and some random counterfeit clothes importer named Boris, Jack eventually busts out the guns to take out waves and waves of enemies and ultimately makes his way up to where Augie is holed up. And I gotta tell you, I didn't expect this voice actor to do a bad impression of Christopher Walken, but like everything else, I absolutely adored it. Officer Slay, what brings you out on a night like tonight? Augie makes a run for it and Jack follows in hot pursuit, gunning down no less than 50 dudes before hitting the streets and probably killing another 50, all before Augie runs into a building and retreats to his apartment. But once Jack gets there, he finds that Augie is taped to a chair and in his surprise, he is shot from the shadows by some mystery man who then picks up Jack's gun to kill Augie with it. This hitman starts talking to someone on the phone, the person who arranged this whole production I guess, and they clearly want Jack Slate left alive to be framed for the murder of Augie. This hitman gloats about how good of a shot he is to shoot Jack in the head without killing him, and he says that police would soon show up to both save him and arrest him for the murder of Augie. And right before Jack passes out, this guy also tells him that Augie Blatz is not the one who killed his father. 
Orgy Blatz did not kill your father. While there are so many loopholes here on why Jack would even be arrested for killing Augie, seeing as how he got shot in the head first, so the killing would have been self-defense, it is simply not addressed at all. Instead, the game flashes forward seven months to Jack in prison, facing execution. More loopholes right off the bat. No way someone would get through trial, let alone be up for execution in as little as seven months. And also, once you step foot out of your cell, inmates start fighting you immediately, saying, hey, it's that cop, like you haven't been cellmates for over half a year at this point. Anyway, Jack is told from a friend inside that there's an inmate that is planning an escape, and he also knows someone in the workshop that makes the electric chair malfunction, allowing Jack a window to escape with his other inmates. After fighting through multiple cell blocks of angry inmates, Jack visits a guy in the workshop that says that battery acid on the conduits of the chair will cause it to short out and allow him to escape, but in exchange for this battery acid, this guy wants some packs of cigarettes. Jack hits some other cell blocks for packs of cigs, doing typical jailhouse competitive things, I guess. Lifting weights, hitting the speed bag, arm wrestling. I don't know. I've never been to jail myself, so this part seems to add up. There is no way that this built motherfucker is struggling to press 135, though. <laughs> Anyway, he exchanges the cigarettes for the acid, and now he's on the hunt for the other inmates with the escape map, who is called Tattoo, for, well, I guess you can guess why. On the way to meet him, he runs into the warden who is kicking Shadow in his kennel, which I guess there's just an animal pound in the middle of this prison for whatever reason. Anyway, Jack kicks the warden's ass for fucking with his dog. Once Jack finds Tattoo, he finds that he isn't very willing to share his escape map. Jack makes quick work of him, though, and takes the map for himself before going back to his cell to enact his own plan of escape. The next day, Jack is put up for execution by electric chair. He is strapped in and given his last rites. Luckily, the pastor that's giving him his final prayer is also helping him out, giving Jack a razor blade to cut the straps and dumping battery acid on the wires for him as he recites his passage. Once the switch is pulled, the power surges, and in the confusion and blinding flashes, Jack escapes his chair and manages to strap down the warden to the seats before the power comes back online, effectively frying the executioner. Jack quickly runs out of the prison, fighting inmates and guards in his path. He uses the escape map to get to the shower drain and leave the prison through the sewer tunnels. Once he's out, there is conveniently a car there waiting for him to try to run him down. Jack is able to dodge this car, and the guy ends up just knocking himself out as he hits a tree. Jack takes his car, his ID, and his phone, and he skedaddles. Jack decides he's gonna head back to Augie's apartment to lay low, as he assumes that no one would be back there anytime soon. I had plenty of work ahead of me. Solve my father's murder and find the guy who set me up. And to do that, I was gonna need guns and information, more or less in that order. On the hunt for guns and information, Jack heads to Chinatown for guns from a guy named Fat Chow, who supplies the triads with all the hardware that they need. Obviously, shortly after arriving, Jack is gunning down triad thugs in quick succession. Before cornering Chow in a gambling den, he asks if he knows Silt, the guy that tried to run him over at the prison, and he says that he usually hangs out at the Black Orchid, a massage parlor. Soon after, cops show up, and since Jack is still an officer of the law, instead of shooting his way out, he simply just runs away. After getting to Black Orchid, it's already looking suspicious. Something smelled fishy, and it wasn't the sushi bar. He ends up getting ambushed by more triads, and after punching them all in the face a whole lot, he runs into the man that he is looking for, Marvin Silt. Silt says that he just had instructions to kill anyone that wasn't tattooed coming out of the prison, and it was really nothing personal. He said that he got the job from a guy named Gopher, but before he says who Gopher was working for, he is shot and killed by a lady who entered the room. Her name is Eve, and she's a killer from some other organization. She simply just wanted Silt dead because he may have killed her brother or something, but she seems friendly enough. She gives Jack some information on the guy that framed him in Augie's apartment. She says that it could be a guy named Patch, a high-tier assassin who is very expensive to hire and even harder to find. And it's not long before they have to shoot their way out of this massage parlor once backup arrives, so Jack and Eve together make the escape, killing Fat Chow once and for all in the end too. Eve gives Jack her card, and tells him to call her if he wants to shoot more bad guys together. But Jack has other things on his mind. Jack heads to his dad's grave to say his goodbyes, since I'm assuming the funeral was held while Jack was in jail, but I don't know why he decided to go in the middle of the night. While he's there, he also happens to run into Hildy in the middle of the night, just there as well to pay respects. Anyway, Hildy says Jack's dad was working on an investigation of Mayor Pinnacle and his military police force called GAC, Grant City's anti-crime unit or something like that. Jack's dad was hired by the mayor candidate Gloria Exner to uncover dirt on him to take 
take him out of power. And as they are talking, shadows are seen running around in the graveyard and soon the shadow starts shooting machine guns. Once Jack sees that they aren't shadows, the reveal he gets really isn't much better. Clowns with guns? I'll be having nightmares about this for months. The graveyard is a massive arena of shooting clowns with guns, and after 10 minutes of fighting these freaks, even taking out a guy on a minigun at one point, Jack escapes. He calls up Eve and asks if she knows anything, and she says that it probably wasn't the mayor trying to kill him because they are planning to kill the mayoral candidate Gloria Exner at the debates tomorrow. So he forgets the clowns for now and decides to rendezvous with Eve to protect Gloria from the thugs. Well, Eve is there to kill more people that she needs to kill, Jack is there to save Gloria at least. On debate day, Jack steals a news chopper to cover Eve as she infiltrates the building and for whatever reason this news chopper has guns strapped to it. Jack clears out waves and waves of enemies for Eve to move forward. She eventually comes across a guy planting bombs which Jack walks her through how to disarm since she just shoots the guy in the face instead of having him do it. But it all comes to a close when the infamous killer Patch gets the better of Eve on the rooftop. Jack's visceral reaction brought a tear to my eye. Eve! Behind you! No! Jack follows Patch out of the building and into his limo where he shoots probably 1,000 rounds into it and dodges rocket launcher attacks before it's finally sent crashing. Patch dies in the crash and Jack is really bummed out about it, but he takes his pager for any new leads. From here, the only place to go is to find Gloria Exner. He saved her from the thugs at the debate and now it's time to see what she knows about all this going on. When he gets to the hotel that she is staying at, he sees Gak Bomb Squad bringing bombs into the hotel and setting up an explosion. So of course he gets in there, and this is the level where you control Shadow a little bit to sniff the bombs out. And of course a normal skill of being a detective, Jack knows how to disarm all these bombs. And he clears all of them before they are set off. On higher levels there are some fires that get set, and Jack has to answer that problem too, with fire extinguishers. He gets to Gloria in time to save her and heads to the rooftop for a battle with a flamethrower cop who he makes quick work of and drops a nasty one-liner on as he kills. Don't you boys know it's not safe to play with matches? And trust me, his one-liners get better as this game goes on. Jack and Gloria get off the building safely and unfortunately Gloria has no information on anything. She just knows that people are out to kill her. Jack says that she can hide out at her dad's cabin while he continues to hunt down this corrupt mayor. Jack gets a message on Patch's pager. It's from Gopher, the guy who also hired Marvin Silt at the prison and he wanted to meet at the docks, so Jack heads there. He confronts Gopher and drops another sick one-liner. Where's Patch? Busy getting embalmed. Oh, bloody hell. Many shootouts ensue, of course. Jack takes out mercenaries and assassins and even a chopper on the docks before coming across a big motherfucker with a crossbow named Longshoreman X. Like if Mr. X took up fishing, I guess. Jack took a beating from this guy, even though he does win in the end, and he hobbles over to the diner where Hildy works before passing out. Hildy stitches Jack up and gets him good to go, but as he wakes up, another guy walks in the diner, a former boxer turned thug named Diggs. He assumes that Jack came into this diner and he's on the hunt, and Jack tries to get the drop on him by coming out of the back room, but it doesn't really go so smoothly. Jack wakes up chained upside down being interrogated by an international criminal named Fahook, and after playing a mini game of Don't Drown, Shadow comes to his rescue and releases him. He escapes the dock after fighting even more hired guns and thugs and almost gets run down by a truck that ends up spilling its load everywhere, revealing what is actually going on here. The truck spilled its contents like a biblical revelation. This was all about gold, money, the root of all evil. Jack leaps on the back of another truck to find out where it's headed, which turns out is an abandoned factory somewhere where they are melting down tons of gold. Like literally tons, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of gold here easily. Jack even runs into some old friends here like Tattoo, who is clearly doing well for himself after escaping prison. Jack also figures everything out once he sees that there are tunnels built right into the factory. The old subway system project went bankrupt and Mayor Pinnacle has been using these tunnels to steal and melt down all the gold in the city, and even using it to have prisoners escaped the prisons to work in this factory. It was all part of his big master plan. The city even used to be called Glitter City apparently because it had a bunch of gold in it, but the name was changed to Grant City once it all disappeared. And now Jack knows the whole truth, and he knows why his dad was killed, because he exits one of these tunnels right where his dad was shot, at that construction site from the very beginning of the game. 
So Jack's dad too also found all this out. From here, Jack decides to infiltrate the mayor's new office, which is inside of a prison where Jack was once a prisoner. It's now abandoned due to the escape when Jack left, but the mayor has taken it over as a base of operations. But before he can reach the mayor, he gets confronted by Diggs again in the gas chamber. And this time, it's an even fight. Well, until Diggs turns on the gas and then puts a mask on himself while still punching Jack in the face. Luckily, you can punch the mask off of him and put it on yourself during the fight, and it turns into a big game of who can wear the mask the longest and who can lose oxygen the fastest. Jack, of course, wins this fight and drops another fucking sick one-liner. Dumb son of a bitch. Jack finally has a face-to-face -face with the mayor, and he gets the real answers to his dad's death. The mayor admits to being corrupt with the prison and the gold, but he is not responsible for killing Jack's dad. That was the corrupt chief of police, Hennessy, who uses Mayor Pinnacle's gold to fund his anti-crime task force. And when Jack's dad found out about the gold, Hennessy had him killed because that was his meal ticket and he didn't want to lose it. The mayor offers Jack a deal. Take out Hennessy and he would pardon Jack of all his crimes. Jack, meanwhile, is having a Jimmy Neutron brain blast trying to figure everything out. Jack takes the deal from Pinnacle and breaks into police headquarters to take Hennessy's files. He guns down a bunch of Gak boys and even comes across clown masks in the evidence locker, revealing who was really after him that night in the graveyard. He also gets the idea to take down Hennessy and Mayor Pinnacle together because he can't let corruption exist in his city. He takes the files and he calls up Gloria Exner with all the information. But of course, it's not that easy. Gloria takes the files and then she pulls a gun on Jack. She decided to cooperate with Mayor Pinnacle instead of fighting him. But luckily, Hildy is there again, uh, randomly in the middle of the night at the graveyard, to save the day. She shoots Gloria and takes the files, but unfortunately for Jack, she too has flipped to work for Fahook, who offered her a lot of money for these files. And well, she's got bills to pay because she used to work for Jack's dad, but now Jack's dad is dead, so she got no job. And she got fired from the strip club after that whole dancing incident. Jack's been double-crossed, like, for the fifth time. Jack follows Hildy out to the Air Force base, where Fahook is going to take the files and flee the country. He sneaks up on Hildy meeting with Fahook, who offers her gold bars in exchange for the files. As she's complaining about not getting cash, she too has been double-crossed. Fahook is working with the mayor, who sneaks out from the shadows and shoots Hildy in the back. Jack, fueled by by rage fights this giant Wilson Fisk of a mare to the death, who takes no damage from punches that you give him. You gotta take his back and choke him out a bunch of times to beat him. One of the most annoying fights in the game by far. After taking Pinnacle out for good, he runs after Fahook before he can escape. He does one of the most bombastic stunts that I've ever seen to propel himself into the cargo plane that is taking off, using the explosion of a motorcycle that he shoots mid-air to launch himself into the open cargo door. Just brilliant. Jack starts taking out everyone he can on this plane and even tries to save a few hostages, or so he thought. It's okay, ladies. I'll get you out of here and back to your family. <laughs> whoa, 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 hey, 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 I'm trying to save you. And once he reaches Fahook, it turns into an annoying fight to have. He has a bottle of something that heals him to full every time he drinks it, and he also uses it to blow fire at you at certain points in the fight. But it's not as bad as the mare fight, in my opinion. It's just a little tedious. After Fahook makes his exit, Jack helps the injured pilot land the plane safely. Once on the ground, Jack meets with a news reporter to give him all the files for him to report on the evening news, and he tells him to also report that Jack Slate died in the crash. There is one final loose end to tie up. The chief of police, Hennessy. You head back to the hotel where the bombs were to confront Hennessy and the rest of his GAC crew. You have a quick little fight with him in a fancy taser riot shield thing, but once it fails after running into a water fountain, he just runs off for you to chase him again. You soon meet back up with him in the furnace of the building to fight Hennessy hand to hand, but somehow Hennessy is able to catch his hands on fire for the fight, and it doesn't really do much good though. You just shove him in this open furnace a few times and he dies pretty quickly much easier than the mayor and Fahook, and really every other fight in the game, it was super easy for a final fight. But that is the end of the game.
Jack took out all the corruption in the city and stacked up an impressive body count. Not counting the hundreds of unnamed thugs, plenty of important people died as well. Mayor Pinnacle, the mayor candidate Gloria Exner, the chief of police Hennessy, the warden of the prison, his crush Hildy, his hit woman girlfriend Eve, and plenty of others. This city is by no means free of crime and corruption, but hell, it was a good start. It's gonna take a lot to rebuild the spots that need to be filled, but Jack did his best to fix his city. And at the very least, he closed the case that his dad died trying to crack, and he avenged his dad's death. While it's not the most deep or in-depth story, I will say it's probably on par with Max Payne's story, maybe a little more comedic and cartoonish, but stories and games around this time, especially shooters on consoles, just weren't that in-depth, so this is a pretty good story considering the time it was released. Dead to Rights was a lot of fun to play, and while the gameplay definitely suffers in comparison to modern titles, the story and writing that this game had to offer was the perfect kind of campy dialogue that I love. And it it was a blast when it came out as well. It was received generally well. It certainly wasn't game of the year or the best thing on the shelves, but it was a nice story-based action shooter with some unique elements like takedowns and slow-mo bullet time stuff that was still kind of new at the time, and having a dog companion, that was pretty freaking cool, and everybody thought so as well. I mean, it was a good enough reception to have a few sequels come out to continue the tale of Jack Slate and Shadow. Before we move on, let me pay the bills and take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, Soylent. A brand focused on making meal replacement drinks containing complete nutrition easy and affordable. And it's totally not made out of people. They've researched not only what nutrients our bodies need, but also sustainable ways to get them and package them in a shelf-stable formula that is surprisingly affordable for the value that you get. Simply put, Soylent has created the world's most perfect food. It's perfect for me at least because sometimes I just get too busy to plan meals and take time to feed myself, so having an option that's not only healthy for me but quick and cheap is almost too good to be true. I'm also a geek when it comes to nutrition and I consume a healthy supply of protein shakes and Soylent offers a fantastic way to add a plant-based protein to my diet without affecting macros or them gains. So if you're a vegetarian and still trying to get shakes with 20 to 30 grams of protein, plus also giving much needed fiber, minerals, and even omega-3 fatty acids look no further than Soylent. My favorite part is that it also tastes way better than most of the other protein options that I would have typically reached for with a nice variety of flavors to boot. The strawberry one is most definitely my favorite, but the mocha one is a close second and that has caffeine in it. And even though they're shelf stable for up to a year, they taste amazing coming straight from the fridge, especially right after a workout or enjoying a sunny spring day in the yard. With that being said, you gotta give Soylent a try if you want a delicious, nutrition-packed option for meal replacement. And the first 500 of you guys that head to the URL in the description and use code HAMMER25 will get 25% off your first subscription. So check that out today. Thank you to Soylent for sponsoring this video. After the relative success of Dead to Rights on the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and the GameCube, Namco wasted no time spreading the love of Jack Slate to other markets available. In 2003, one year after the original game's release, they made a PC port for Windows that was more or less a one-to-one -one port of the OG game. But one year after that, they decided to port the game yet again, becoming the fifth iteration of Dead to Rights is none other than the version for the Game Boy Advance, and all of its 240p glory. And I'm not hating on the Game Boy Advance either, I loved mine, cherished it even, but there came a time and place for portable games back in the early 2000s. It wasn't like it is now. I can play pristine looking AAA titles on my Steam Deck from the comfort of a Boeing plane, and the only worry that I has is if the game will distract me enough from the anxiety I have of the hole's integrity. Back in the early 2000s and the Game Boy days though, games were not one to one, so unless a game was specifically designed to be sprite based and released on the Game Boy, it's most likely going to look like trash. And while Dead to Rights doesn't look as bad as other titles, it certainly isn't winning any awards with its looks, which 
would be okay if it at least played well, but again, it's not winning any awards. In fact, the gameplay might be some of the most stale and repetitive on the entire Game Boy system. Nothing about what made the game fun to play on the original consoles translated to the handheld formats on the Game Boy Advance. It's the same run and gun style combat with slow motion dives and shadow as a deployable attack puppy, but it all feels bad. The run and gun is more of just stand and shoot, as there's no option to strafe while aiming your weapon. The slow motion doesn't really feel like slow motion, like Jack's sprite is moving slower, but nothing else in the game seems to let you know that you're in this sweet bullet time mechanic. The music and the sound effects, they don't change at all. The enemies just kind of stand still and Jack slowly falls to the ground. I get it, it's probably limitations of the hardware, but I feel like they could have done something to zhuzh up the slow motion. And using Shadow is just clunky. It was more trouble than it was worth using him on enemies because the shooting was just simpler and the enemies die really quickly. I honestly forgot Shadow was in the game often. To use Shadow you had to hit left trigger and A together and to dive you just double tap the left trigger. And 9 times out of 10, I'm just diving. The shadow animation wasn't even that cool, but even worse, he runs up to enemies so slow, and the whole time they're just still shooting you in the face while shadow is just sauntering up to them. So it's better to just take the dive and take him out. I do wish that the little sprite shadow was just running around at least behind Jack as he shot people because he truly feels like he's not even in the game. And the sections where you fist fights are worse. I could barely tell if I was hitting enemies most of the time until they just fell to the ground. The animation were just undercooked for melee combat. And the camera controls were just trying their hardest to give me motion sickness the whole time. Every time you moved in a different direction, it would pan the camera and it was just terrible. But like most games in this series, the fist fighting and the camera controls are kinda trash, so at least that's on par. All that could be forgiven, but the fact of the matter is, even in its original state on the Xbox, Dead to Rights was not carried by its gameplay. It was fun and passable, but it was the dialogue and the characters and the cutscenes that really stole the show and made the game campy and special. And in this version of the game, there's not any voice acting, just text bubbles and still frames. It took everything that the game had going for it and just released the game without it. The story of the game is like an abridged version of the first game. It follows the same story beats, but simplifies the already linear levels. To its credit, it does keep in some of the mini games that Jack had to be put through. Well, really just lock picking and lifting weights in prison. Look at little Sprite Jack overhead pressing. <gasps> if only they let you do the strip mini game as Hildy in this one, but we all take an L there. Overall, there isn't much here to talk about. It's your typical Game Boy Advance demake of a game that was carried by things that couldn't quite make it on the Game Boy Advance, like cool slow-mo shooting and campy voice acting. Not like anyone's choice in playing a 20 year old Game Boy Advance game relies on my blessing, but I don't recommend it. Just play the original game, and if you want something portable, play Max Payne on the Steam Deck, or hell, play Max Payne on the Game Boy Advance over this Game Boy Advance game. Dead to Rights wasn't the most fascinating or enthralling game ever made, but it had plenty of redeeming qualities to it, and that squared it away in the sort of so bad it's kind of good category. Unfortunately, Namco took zero notes on what worked for Jack Slate and pissed out a sequel that took everything good from the first game and just tossed it out the window, while polishing the gameplay and combat a little bit and hoping that that would be enough for this game to stand on. Spoilers. It really wasn't. In 2005, we got Dead to Rights 2, Too Dead, Too Furious. It's kind of impressive how bland that this game turned out to be when they had some solid material to work with. Jack Slate was a hard-boiled noir detective with charming quips and one-liners. He had a cool dog that would rip out bad guys' carotid arteries at a simple command. There was a cool slow-motion dive move that you can do while shooting your weapons. And there were even some decent mini-games to be had. Brutal disarm animations and very varied mission structures to drive the whole thing home. The sequel somehow incorporated most of these things, and while at first glance this game looks like it was rushed out in less than a year to keep the Dead to Rights name relevant, but this game came out three years after the first game, and it still feels underdeveloped. But perhaps the most egregious mistake Namco made was to try to make Jack into something that he was never meant to be. Cool.
The game opens with a cinematic much like the first game, although this one plays up on Jack being a nonchalant badass or something, casually stopping an armed robbery at the corner store on his way to pick up a six pack. Honestly, it's a cool animation, but it just doesn't properly set you up for the actual game that lies ahead. The story of this game functions as a prequel to the first game. Logically, I think that makes sense since Jack killed nearly everyone in power in the first game. To kick the game off, Jack gets assigned to the case of a kidnapped judge and family friend named Alfred McGuffin, who had uncovered a crime syndicate in the city and has files on the corrupt individuals in power. The McGuffin files, if you will. McGuffin, of course, being the term to describe a plot device that drives the story forward while also having very little importance in itself. The name choice is, of course, an on-the-nose reference to this by also having the first name being Alfred, after Alfred Hitchcock, the director who popularized the term in the 1930s. Anyway, McGuffin gets judge napped and Jack Slate is on the prowl, starting off the same way he did the last game, by driving his car right through the front door of the first mission. Kind of a self-aware joke in this game, I think every level starts with him smashing through the front door with a vehicle. Really, the whole story is just a slap together homage to the first game. You even start the game going after a slime bag who runs the local strip club similar to Augie Blatt's. You go on from level to level taking down anyone who stands in your way, from low level car thieves, a biker gang, and Chinese triads, and all the way up to the Russian Mafia. But as Jack says, Mafia, triads, they all take the same bullets. Hm. Testosterone much? Let's go ahead and get into the gameplay of Dead to Rights 2. As tempting as it is to copy and paste my gameplay overview from the first video, there are a few differences and I'm sad to say most of them are for the worst. Overall, it's the same run and gun style gameplay with lock on targeted shooting. You get the option to dive around and multi-target enemies, although this time you can look all the way around you when diving now, before you were locked into one line of sight during the dive, but this game has you able to look around 360 degrees while free falling to the pavement. Disarms make a welcome return with several different animations being implemented for each different weapon type and they're just as pleasing to perform as in the first title. You can also grab a poor enemy and use them as a meat shield for the hundreds of bullets flying your way. There are some throwable weapons now in addition to the simple exploding canisters that Jack loves to toss into the fray and shoot for a satisfying explosion. And there are environmental things that you can shoot as well to clear out a bunch of bad guys like vehicles and the typical video game red barrel. Shadow is back again, but he's almost as disappointing to use as he was in the first game. Just a single attack and weapon retrieval. No fancy animations or different use cases for him. I think the only difference is the fact that you can see him running around you all the time now in real time gameplay and are able to use him a little bit more often. So he's a little bit more than just a free kill button that spawns out of thin air, but really not much. Actually, they take away moments where you can control Shadow altogether. He's even more of a backseat character this go around. In fact, they took away all the variations in gameplay and mini games. Didn't have time for mini games. Now, I'm not saying that I missed the polygon ass cheeks or Operation Bomb defusals, but it seems kind of weird to take away something that was such a big part in the first game and not adding anything else to break up the monotony of running and gunning for eight straight missions. I think shooter games have a tough time when it comes to implementing and gameplay styles because you are a shooter game. You're assuming that your audience wants to shoot people. But when it's just non-stop waves and waves of enemies every level with no rest, it gets very boring very quickly. And it makes you realize just how much the mini games, the longer sequences of fist fighting, and the interesting boss fights broke up the pace of the gunplay in the first game. This game has no mini games. The fist fighting sections are a fraction of the time in each level, and the boss fights are just bullet sponge shootouts with respawning minions to gun down until the main baddie is dead. The boss fights are just terrible. You can't even focus down the boss and try to kill him to ignore all the underlings flooding in as the health bar is broken into sections and once you drain one or two of them you have to wait a little bit before you can damage the fucker again. Who thought that was a good idea? This biker dude with sideburns and shark teeth needs 1500 rounds to put him down? Ridiculous. What do you think about them apples huh boy? It is kind of weird to use the things that seem the most out of place in the first game as a comparison, like the chopper shootouts, the weird mini games, and choking out the mayor of the city, but I think this is a strong case of you don't know what you got until it's gone, and when it's gone, it's just 
stale, stale gunplay. I think in the first level of the game, you probably kill over 50 dudes. 50 guys in a nightclub. That's gotta be a violation of the fire code or something, but at the very least, it's a violation of engaging gameplay. I think the most non-combat thing that you do is hit switches and interact with key cards and stuff, and the game really tried to make Jack look as cool as possible doing this. Either that or they couldn't animate him picking up a key card off a desk, so you know what we're gonna do? Have him slam his hand down into the table and then have the card slow motion flip into the air just for him to grab it. Yeah, that's cool. That's what the kids want. The whole game is just a fever dream of killing enemies in an area, then turning a corner to let more spawn in, and then turning another 90 degrees and, you guessed it, more enemies. The same type of enemies, the same type of shooting, and it makes it worse that these areas that the game takes you to are just kind of nonsensical. At least in the first game, the levels are all incorporated with each other. You start at the construction sites, and then you end up in jail, and then the gold refinery, and then once you break out, you find that all these places are linked through underground tunnels, and they all serve a purpose. This game just has you going to an ice rink or a biker bar or a triad temple with no rhyme or reason, just to have the climax take place in a casino hotel or something. It's just lazy. Some of the environments were done pretty well for a PS2 era game, but most of them were just like brick walls and boxes and shipping containers, like just generic asset flips. So it's pretty clear that the gameplay is not holding up very well compared to the first game. I mean, some things are an improvement, so the guns feel a little bit easier to use, and the fist fighting is generally better, but overall it is a deduction from the first game. But let's see how the writing and the plot to this game holds up. You're gonna be a superstar at Iron Point unless you talk. Ow. Like I said before, the plot of this game functions as a prequel to the first game, and it's overall incredibly similar in a lot of ways. The game opens with Jack and Shadow getting ready in his office at the precinct. He goes over how Judge McGuffin had announced that he has some files on the corrupted elite in Grant City, and he was ready to go public with this information. This revelation, however, led him to just getting kidnapped by all those that he was going to reveal. Jack makes a quip about how the chief of police, Hennessy, didn't want him on the case, probably hinting at Hennessy already being one of the corrupted elites in the files, but since MacGuffin is a family friend to Jack, he is going to hunt down his abductors anyway. Jack gets a call from his girlfriend Ruby, who he sent to do some undercover ops at the local strip club in order to get a lead on who took the judge, and she gives him the name of Grant City's porn king, Hector Cruz. So it takes no time for Jack to drive his cruiser right through the front door of the Blue Fly Dance Club. Valet parking my ass! After shooting his way through dozens of armed men in the club, he runs into Hector out back of the establishment and does some hands-on questioning for some more intel. Hector points him in the direction of the abandoned ice rink, now home to a gang of car thieves called the Scorpions. He says that they took the judge there to keep him somewhere off the grid, so Jack on his way to the second location of course arrives by slamming his car into one of the stolen cars at the ice rink, crushing a poor guy in the process. After dispatching all the scorpions, he comes across the van that they used to kidnap the judge, but no judge. He fortunately decided to keep one of these gang leaders alive for some information, chaining him upside down in the garage and threatening to burn him with gasoline. This guy talks pretty quick though and sends Jack in the direction of some biker gang called the Death Riders that hangs out at a bar called the South Star, arriving there by crashing into a line of bikes parked outside. My bike! It is here that Jack eventually finds Judge McGuffin, alive and well. Well, just long enough for him to spit out a single line of dialogue before he gets shot in the head. The leader of the Death Riders named Houston shot and killed the judge and very arrogantly claims to have the files and there's nothing that Jack can do about it. But after some taunting, using Houston as a dartboard, he tells Jack that the files are locked up in an old church downtown. This is the first place that Jack shows up that he properly parks his vehicle at the start of the mission. But I bet it's only because his girl Ruby is riding on the back of the bike. But that doesn't stop him from busting through the front door like an Avengers level threat. Who the fuck is there? Landshark. I'm Jack Slate, bitch. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! After clearing out the area, Jack and Ruby move in to crack the safe that holds these files. Jack holds off more enemies while Ruby does the safe cracking, but soon they get it open and they find not all of the files, but there is some information on the Black Dragon Triad, so at the very least, Jack has his next lead. 
And back to the status quo, Jack rams the front gate of this temple that these guys are holed up in with a box truck. There isn't much chatting to be had here. Jack lays out countless triads members before taking on the leader named Hong Se. After gunning him down, Jack holds Hong over the ledge of the temple and tries to get some more intel, but all he gets is that there's something going on at the docks tonight. The docks! There's something going down on the docks tonight! Thanks. Oh, remember when I promised to kill you last? I love you. And while there is no animation showing that Jack drove into the docks warehouse to start this mission, there is clearly evidence left behind to show that he, in fact, did. Anyway, there is of course a bunch of baddies here to put down, and this is one of the more long and drawn out levels in the game that has tons of enemies around every corner, going from the docks to a ship to various warehouses and industrial buildings, all before seeing the leader of the Russian mob, Bob Blanchov, pull up in a limo outside. Jack gets the drop on him, but unfortunately Blanchov was one step ahead and kidnapped Ruby in order to make Jack disarm himself. His goons take Jack over to the pier in order to execute him, but Shadow, yeah, you know that dog that's kind of forgotten about until now, uh, he noms on the bad guys and gives Jack the escape that he needs to chase down Blanchoff. But he's too late. Ruby gets shoved in the car and they head off. But Ruby has some kind words of advice for her boo thing. Shoot the fucking bad guys next time, okay? After this rendezvous at the docks, Jack said that he was called in for violent behavior by the chief of police, Hennessy. And this makes Jack stop and think if Hennessy is in fact in on these corrupt plays happening in the city. Obviously, since this is a prequel, we know that is exactly what is going on. Still, Jack moves on to Blanchaw's penthouse to take him face on. And he's greeted with a chopper on the rooftop to make for another aggravating level to get through. He guns down half the population of Estonia and then goes through all the gaudy decorated rooms in the penthouse before finding Blanchov and Ruby. Jack Slate tries to be tough since he has the upper edge, but he really should have listened to Ruby's advice in the limo. Game over, Blanchov. Your friend was right, Mr. Slate. Always shoot the fucking bad guy first. Ah. No! Ruby! Ruby dies in Jack's arms, and he's ready to put Blanchoff six feet under. He chases Blanchoff out onto the roof, but unfortunately, that pesky chopper was there to sweep him away. And conveniently, another one is primed and ready to swoop in to shoot at Jack. A whole army of people and an air force just to take down one detective and his dog. But since Jack is in his badass stage, this still isn't enough. As I destroyed another useless object, it hit me. She was right. Always shoot the fucking bad guys first. Blanchoff is celebrating his win, thinking that Jack Slate is dead, and saying that he sold the MacGuffin files to his friend. He doesn't really name the friend, but it's likely Hennessy or maybe even Pinnacle before he takes power and becomes mayor. His celebration is cut short by a pissed off Jack busting into their compound though. They thought that their security was high enough, but they clearly don't know that Jack can and will drive through every door and wall that he needs to to get somewhere. This place is like a hotel and casino, it's by far one of the most frustrating levels, just due to the sheer amount of enemies and rooms to clear, but thankfully the boss fight at the end is as simple and as straightforward as the rest of them. And all things considered, I definitely prefer this one over the helicopter fight. The only bad part about it is this probably is the most unsatisfying ending that I've ever played in a game. Jack has been doing all these badass monologues all game, and when it comes to taking down the leader of the Russian mob, the guy who killed his girlfriend in cold blood, he just says bye bye and shoots him once in the chest. Bye bye. No. And then recaps on just how unsatisfying this whole thing is. Jack lost the judge, he lost his girl, and he lost the files. He went through the whole game and fought thousands of unnamed thugs just to come out with less than he started with. At the very least, he killed some of the corrupt gangs in the city. The Russian mob, the Death Riders, the Scorpions, the Black Dragon Triads. But in a city like Grant City, there is always going to be new villains ready to swoop in and take the power. Which I guess is why the first game still has so many corrupt individuals to take out. They got what they wanted. I ended up with nothing. They had me dead to rights. I also want to note at the end, that is not the right way to use the phrase dead to rights. What, what the fuck is that? You'd think for a series of games named after this phrase, they would at least know what the phrase means. 
The story to this game wasn't as bad as I initially thought it was going to be. I think it's a pretty well done prequel to the first title, and they even kept some goofy and campy charm in the writing that I appreciated. I think the spot they went wrong with was trying to make Jack this burnt out and broken man. In the first game, he was more quirky and charming, and this game is making him out to be kind of a broken soul, but I guess I can see it going either way. He was kind of a blunt and emotionless man in the first game, but the awkwardness came off as funny rather than bleak, like when he told Hildy that his dad was dead for the first time. Yeah, don't worry about it. He's already dead. What? I wish as a prequel it would have shown more character background growth rather than the formation of the citywide corruption of Grant City. Show Jack as a beat cop before he was a detective, or how he got Shadow in the first place, or incorporate his father into the story somehow since we only know him as a corpse from the first game. I think they dropped the ball in a lot of points when writing this story, but for what they did it wasn't that bad. In the end though, the story isn't a super big deal. It did well for what it needed, but the big problem this game had was that it fell so flat in the gameplay department. It took some cool things from the first game like diving, disarming and shielding but completely stripped away any kind of gameplay that wasn't combat and the combat just wasn't good enough to prop the whole game up on one gameplay element. I truly don't know why they took away the mini games or the shadow controlled missions or even any interesting boss fights just to not replace them with anything else. This game is just shooting and shooting and shooting maybe a punch or two and then some more shooting and it's just straight up not a good time. It's also insanely difficult. I lowered the settings down to easy after the first mission and I still died an insane amount of times. After five iterations with the first game and then a prequel with Dead to Rights 2, we have finally gotten to the point where it's time to take Jack Slate back to handheld gaming. Although this time it's not just a bastardized port of a prior game, it's a whole new game. And it's on the glorious console called the PlayStation Portable. And it's made by Rebellion Developments, a respectable game dev with a ton of cool titles under their belt and also quite the resume when it comes to making well done PSP games. So I think off the jump, Dead to Wright's Reckoning has a lot more going for it than our old Game Boy Advance counterparts. Even though on paper it looks like it'd be a solid entry, it's, it's not. Now, this may be me jaded looking back at a 19 year old PSP title and saying, oof, that's rough to play, but oof that's rough to play. The movement feels restrictive in an odd way, like it's almost tank controls in a game that's supposed to be a run and gun shooter. If you're moving in a straight line, then it's not too bad, but once you have to take a turn, it's like Jack's shoulders are fused right into a spinal column. And I don't know what it is about this entire series of games, even with several different developers taking the control over Jack Slate, why does the camera control suck in every single title? Even in Retribution, which is without a doubt the best title in the series, the camera controls are still kind of clunky in certain actions. But anyway, in this game with Jack's inability to take a 90 degree turn combined with a camera that just doesn't cooperate, the game is clunky at best and downright aggravating most of the time. Turning down an alleyway or a corridor in a building results in you taking several shots to the chest before you can even see the enemy that you're supposed to be shooting. Also staying in tradition with every game in the series other than Retribution, that game finally got it right, the hand to hand combat is absolutely booty cheeks. It's miles better than the Game Boy Advance, but even the original Xbox title was better than this PSP version. It was infuriating. Again, roping back to the camera, it was just god awful. The rest of the mechanics are actually quite passable though. The slow motion diving felt nice, shooting in a straight line was fun, and Shadow was there. I know it's just the hardware limitations again, but when you use Shadow, he just kind of teleports to an enemy and does the most lackluster kill animation that I've ever seen. But he does work and the mechanics to use him aren't a pain in the ass. On the plus side, the game doesn't look half bad. Most of the environments and assets seem to be reused from Dead to Rights 2. Hell, some of the locations are one to one, but I'm not mad at that. At least they look good and are well designed and it could have been much, much worse. The game does take another massive L with the lack of voice acting in the cutscenes, but at least we get an original story here and it's relatively entertaining reading some new shit and the writing was actually really good, rather than the same stuff from a prior game just displayed to us in a less entertaining way. And the cutscenes are a little animated, so there's another plus to be had. The story is 
quite unique to the series and canon I suppose if you care about the lore of Jack Slate so I do want to go over it here because it's actually quite campy and goofy and I quite liked it. The game starts with a grizzled looking Jack Slate, on brand so far. He says he received an anonymous message, one of them old fashioned notes where someone meticulously cut out each letter of a magazine or something so you couldn't trace their handwriting. The good stuff. The note reads, the girl will die unless you come to the pink starfish before sunrise, alone. And as we all know Jack Slate, he isn't one to call for backup anyway, so alone was no problem, as long as Shadow could be a plus one injustice. Okay, that was pretty lame. Jack makes his way to the Pink Starfish, a motel of sorts in the middle of biker country just outside of Grant City, and there he decides to start tallying up that body count. Once he makes it to where the hostage was being held though, there is no sign of her. There's just a caption that reads, they must have heard me coming, as there's a slow pan over to dead bodies just laying in a parking lot. That's that good campy writing that I like to see. I just wish we had Jack voice acting this, as it'd be one of the best in the series. In the room though, there's another note for Jack that says, go to the Grove, a notorious biker hangout in Grant City. This biker bar is pretty much the same one from Dead to Rights 2, and as Jack arrives, he says he'll probably run into Mumbai, the biker gang's leader. And he does. He actually just shoots the shit out of him, and I didn't even realize that this was a boss fight or anything until he was already dead. Just look like the rest of the thugs, the rest of the level. But now the leader, Mumbai, is not going to answer any questions. But luckily for Jack, in spawns in Hino, the triad leader for some reason, and now we transition to enemy type number two in the game and go after the triads in the train yard. Triads in the train yard, right after bikers in the bar. Is this alliteration thing going to go on all game? Jack chases Hino through a few dozen triads, gunning them all down with ease. Apparently Hino is leading Jack on a chase all through town. And when they get to the next area, Jack shows up in front of a burning police cruiser and says, there was no time to park the car. The writing in this game is just killing it here, I gotta be honest. This of course is the ice rink level from the second game, and in this game it is the triads hideout. Jack Jack of course is still hunting Hino for a lead on the hostage, and once he gets his hands on him, his plan for getting info is shooting the shit out of him and then punching him to death when he runs out of ammunition. Hino was dead. I had no leads. This fucking guy. Jack heads back to his apartment to chill after killing a small army of men, and speaking of small armies, a militia is waiting for him at his apartment building. Army at the apartment. Oh my god, this alliteration is real. This is one of the levels where you fight a helicopter in the second game, and thank Shadow that is not the case here. Just more shooting bad boys. This level has some of the worst offenses from the god awful camera though. I would almost prefer a chopper fight. As Jack arrives to his apartment thinking that he was safe, it turns out it was rigged to explode, so he and Shadow tuck and roll out of a window as the bombs go off. But now at least Jack has another lead. The militia camp is south of the border. Whatever that means. State border, country border, who knows. But Jack is dead set on making the militia leader pay for burning his Yadro at his apartment. After plenty of murder, he finds a map to a lodge owned by the militia on a wall. So off we go. The lodge is apparently an abandoned church in the middle of nowhere with a cemetery and all. Making it super convenient when Jack kills 112 guys here. The climax of this level takes place where Jack and his girlfriend from the second game crack the safe and learn of the triad's involvement. The safe is even here in the same spot and it contains the directions to the next level. Kind of crazy that the safe was just left here for all the criminals and Jack to use again a few years later and it still holds some vital information to plots of each game. And it's kind of weird how Jack knew how to crack the safe now but conveniently forgot how to and needed to invite his girlfriend years later to do it again. Anyway, the safe contained a key to an address in Grant City, and Jack has a hunch that this might be significant. The location is a meat cooler run by the Cabal. The Cabal in the cooler. This has to be on purpose, right? Instead of questioning the leader and learning from his mistakes, Jack just keeps shooting until everyone is dead, even the leader of the gang that has information that he needs. Fortunately for him, this leader has details on the man that she was working for in her pocket or something, so he knows where to go next. The man that she was working for is a guy named Whisper. Jack says that they've met before and he's the reason that he's got bandages wrapped around his head. One, that's a badass line. And two, this is just a ripoff of Hush from DC Comics, is it not? Both with bandages on their face and both named after soft speaking. 
Jack ends the introduction to Hush, I mean Whisper, by saying that that's another story, but I really want to know this story, like why is his face wrapped in bandages? What the fuck did you do to this guy? Apparently Whisper lives in a mansion on an island, so this breaks the alliteration scheme here. If it was Hush, it could have been Hush in the house or some shit like that, but nope, we get Whisper in the mansion and it ruins the whole game. Anyway, Jack steals a boat and heads there, hoping that the girl is there. Damn, I almost forgot the reason why we were doing this. Some girl was kidnapped by bikers slash triads slash cabal slash some guy named Whisper. Jack guns through the mansion and all of Whisper's thugs and finally gets to the man himself, having a gunfight on his nice ass deck in the back of his mansion. And once he kills him, Jack drops another cold ass line. It would take more than bandages to fix Whisper up this time. God damn, the writing in this game is just really good. And just like that, the hostage comes running out. The day is saved. Jack killed 4,000 people to save this one girl. But wait, she said that Whisper was her father. And this Whisper guy used his own daughter to bait Jack Slate into a trap. Shadow is flabbergasted. The hostage is pretty angry, considering that her dad was disfigured by this guy, and now this guy comes back and murders him. Jack is looking pretty bad here to this girl, I'm not gonna lie. So she picks up her dad's gun and starts shooting at Jack, and Jack of course shoots back. So now this hostage, the reason we are here to begin with, is now the boss fight, a schoolgirl in a short skirt with a button down shirt getting shot by a detective dual wielding sawn off shotguns. God, I love this game series. After a couple shots though, she realizes that she's no match for Jack Slate and decides to gracefully backflip off of the deck into the rocky shore below. This shit is so goofy, man. <laughs> what the fuck? Jack walks to the edge and says, Shadow and I are alive. Everyone else is dead. It was over. <laughs> And that's how the game fucking ends. 10 out of 10. If the gameplay wasn't so terrible, I swear this would be my favorite game in the series. What a roller coaster of a game. Jack chases lead after lead in this investigation of a kidnapped girl, only to kill each lead every time he catches up to them, and then just waiting for the next bad guy group to show up and give him more thugs to kill, all leading to some guy that he has a history with. And it turns out this guy set the whole thing up using his own daughter as the fake kidnapped victim, only to die in front Front of her causing her to be blinded by rage and try to kill Jack Slate herself only giving up after 10 seconds and swan diving into the ocean just fantastic Cormac McCarthy level of writing right there anyway that's the PSP game Dead to Rights Reckoning. Like the Game Boy Advance title, I don't recommend that you play it. After the story rundown, that's really all you need to know about the game. The gameplay was miserable, and it's time to move on to what is, in my opinion, the best game in the series, and unfortunately, the final game in the series. Jack, people are looking for you. Yeah, all the wrong people. So after making a name as a Max Payne clone and then busting out a prequel and then a PSP title that was a prequel to that prequel, it's only obvious that the next step for the series on the next generation of consoles is to make a reboot of the first game. Because who actually needs sequels anyway? Retribution, unlike the first two games in the series, is not developed by Namco and is actually born from the minds of Volatile Studios, a team known for their video game adaptation of Reservoir Dogs. An interesting title, but when it came to grabbing the torch of the established Dead to Rights series, they decided not to complicate things and simply give the fans of the series more of what they want, shooting and brawling at the hands of an edgy loose cannon cop who has a canine partner with an affinity to ripping out bad guy's carotid arteries. <laughs> Dead to Rights at this point is still kind of an underrated franchise. Definitely not as respected of a series as games like Max Payne, so maybe a gritty 7th gen reboot is just what they needed to revamp this series. You still play as Jack Slate, and he's still a loose cannon as he was in other games, but he is a lot more scruffy and standoffish in this title, and causes a whole lot more brutal bloodshed. Dude's got a sick Alpine Stars motorcycle jacket, and if they got the licensing for it, I'd imagine Imagine he'd have tap out shirts and monster energy cans all over his stuff too. He's just as cool as you can imagine someone being in 2010. 
The story in Retribution more or less follows the same sort of tale as the first game, just with better explanations and backstory, with a few other key players changed around. Jack's dad dies while he's in an investigation of a man named Riggs, and his death actually seems like it affects Jack more than it did before. Before, his reaction was numb and disinterested, while in this game, it's much more emotional. The victim's name is Slate. Frank Slate. My... He's my dad. This is Slate, badge B26354. Officer down! Repeat, I've got an officer down! Uh, 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 city port, dark side east, oh, request immediate assistance! Oh god, oh god, no! Oh god! And that's probably the biggest difference in writing for the stories, or at the very least, the voice acting. Jack Slate feels like someone with feelings and thoughts now, rather than just an empty husk. He's way more fleshed out and upgraded as a character from his 2002 counterparts. And as far as other characters from the story in that game, there aren't many carryovers into this reboot. Even one of the main characters, Hildy, is replaced from the first game by a new female interest named Faith Sands, who is an EMT. So unfortunately, that means there's no more stripper pole minigames. So if that was a selling point for you, just go ahead and leave this one on the shelf. With that being said though, let's talk about the biggest change and in my opinion, improvements in this game being the gameplay. The game revolves around the same series mainstay mechanics being brawling, shooting, and dog. Each type of gameplay is vastly improved and takes inspiration from other great games rather than just Max Payne. The shooting reminds me of Gears of War and kind of Uncharted in certain ways, a sort of cover-based combat that feels heavy with its movements but not clunky. The fighting takes some notes from the Batman Arkham game with many more punching combinations and awesome finisher moves, and the shadow sections are oddly enough stealth portions of the game, also taking notes from Batman with a sort of detective mode that Shadow can use to see through walls, giving some nice variety and some peace within the chaos of this over-the-top shooter. The shooting elements of the game add a little more modern aspect to the series while also bringing over some loved elements from prior titles. Jack relies a lot more on taking cover in this game. While it was possible in previous titles, it was rarely ever used, at least in my experience, and in this game, it's a smoother mechanic and makes certain levels much easier. You can even blind fire around cover this go around, which I don't think was an option in the last games. With that said, it's not the best thing ever. It makes some levels a crawl to get through, and simply hopping from cover to cover and killing a handful of bad guys is not the most engaging gameplay loop. Luckily, it's not the whole game, but it is a larger portion of it. The option to grab a human shield is in this game, but that is also also a whole lot better implemented. Jack sort of muscles them into a bent over position and then uses them as a way to move forward in cover at faster speed and kind of ambushes other guys trying to shoot his face. When grabbing enemies, you get the option to not only use them as a shield, but you can toss them like off of a railing or into an electrified fence and also do some sick disarm moves if they're holding a gun. They aren't as flashy as the disarms in prior games, but that's because those brutal animations are used in the hand to hand combat finishers that we'll get to in a second. The focus bar in this game functions the same as adrenaline in prior titles. It is primarily used as fuel for the sweet, sweet slow motion bullet time that we just all love to use. There isn't much to go into about it, so there's nothing really has changed that much with that mechanic. You just slow time down to line up beautiful headshots on your enemies. The guns in this game aren't much to write home about either. They feel sort of generic, like there isn't much oomph to them, they are just kind of a means to an end. Except the shotgun. Shotgun, always best gun. It's kind of hard to fuck up, honestly. It's not a terrible shooting system, but it's pretty bare bones. There are several pistols, shotguns, SMGs, and assault rifles to use, as well as more specialized weaponry like grenade launchers, sniper rifles, and throwables like grenades and flashbangs. All the weapon designs have this sort of futuristic cyberpunk aesthetic to them, which is pretty sick, but like I said, the, they function kind of like regular guns. There isn't anything cool or unique about them. They just, they shoot well and they kill enemies. And there's plenty to go around. There there is more than enough firepower to get the job done in most cases. But of course, if that's not enough, Jack has his hands. Uh, are we just gonna keep talking, old man? Are we gonna actually fight? <laughs> 
the melee combat in this game is a lot more satisfying to get into. Not as much as a chore this go around and actually quite fun and in depth if you want to take it that way. There are several combinations and fancy moves that you can do. Absolutely brutal finisher moves, slick counter attacks and even cool ways to break the guard of an enemy to land some hits. All while being more functional in an environment where you get surrounded by several enemies at once with a way to have directional attacks kind of like the Arkham games fighting style. A vast improvement over the mechanics in the prior games. Even with all those changes I wouldn't say the melee combat is the star of the show here. I don't like how shoehorned in it is in a lot of sections like the opening chapter makes sense because Jack gives his badge and his gun to the captain before disobeying orders and entering the building but in other sections Jack resorts to fisticuffs simply because he wants to or his dad suggests it. Let's take a look but no gunfire. Shooting guns is still how I'd prefer to play this game, and thankfully that is still the vast majority of the gameplay. But when you are forced to fight, at least it is fun this time. Circling back on those brutal finisher moves though, these things have gone off the deep end. These are manhunt and punisher levels of brutal, and I think they are a bit slept on. Advancing from the already brutal hand-to-hand -hand ones, once Jack starts adding weapons into the equation, it gets R-rated very fast. He throws a grenade in a guy's shirt and then tosses him into the air before he explodes, or knocks a guy to the ground with a leg sweep from his sniper rifle before impaling his skull with the barrel and then firing it like that wasn't enough damage. Or my personal favorite, he throws a guy down and then steps on his back while shooting him point blank with a grenade launcher using the explosion to launch into the air like a superhero. This guy is an officer of the law by the way. But these brutal animations all tie into the gritty revamping of the series, and I'm absolutely not mad at them. The last part of the gameplay that was heavily revamped were the sections where you control Shadow. Good boy. When it comes to normal gaming as Jack, Shadow is about the same as prior games as far as in-game functionality. You get a little more control of him and what he does in the midst of gameplay, but he sort of functions the same. You can use him to scout ahead, attack enemies, pick up guns, or even hold a guy still while you finish him off. Still the best doggo that there is, even though I think tasting all that human blood may have an effect on his psyche at this point. The big change comes in the missions where you control Shadow independently of Jack. Controlling Shadow like this is a first for the series in terms of attacking and having some kind of agency. In the first game you controlled Shadow for some bomb sniffing expeditions, but in this game you get to give him a 5 star course of cowboy cap. Caviar. The game actually opens up with a brief prologue that is predominantly shadow gameplay, but it only consists of running around and attacking guys as they try to shoot at an injured Jack. The real innovation to shadow comes in later missions, where Jack sends shadow into a locked area to retrieve keys to open the door. These missions are sort of stealth based operations, shadow prowls in the shadows, killing guards silently and even hiding their bodies so they don't get discovered and raise some alarms. He has a special vision that senses heartbeats through walls and gives him an advantage on enemies. Kind of another feat taken from the Batman Arkham games as it's quite similar to Batman's detective vision. It's fair to say that Shadow truly lives up to his name in these portions of the game. These areas are nice changes of pace for the game but again it's not the main draw of the game and that's okay. I think these portions where you aren't just running and gunning are valuable to the series as a whole because that run and gun gameplay gets very boring very quickly. Even though it was revamped and improved upon, you need a little change of pace to get the crowd going. Going. Dead to Rights 2 is a testament to that. All in all though, Retribution has the best and most engaging combat and gameplay in the whole series, and I think Volatile did a terrific job translating the core values of the series into a modern title with fluid mechanics and brutality. I think they also knocked the storytelling out of the park too, so with that being said, let's dissect the plots of this game. Everything on TV, it's a lie. You want the truth. I'll tell you the truth. CNN is fake news. The game starts with our hero Jack Slate, bruised and battered, stepping gracefully out of a boat that pulls into some industrial looking docks. He's greeted by some thugs that recognize him as the fuck who had them run out of Chinatown, and they decided to get some revenge on him in his weakened state for this, especially since his trusty canine companion is nowhere to be seen. But as soon as they move towards Jack, Shadow is seen, and he's an angry boy. This short little prologue is just about three minutes of running around as Shadow and tearing guys to shreds while an injured Jack waddles behind. But once all the thugs are dead, Jack manages to make his way up to a diner to meet with someone named Faith. 
Faith mentions how people are worried and looking for him and asks him to reach out to the department for help, but Jack says that there's no more department and everything on the TV is a lie. Jack decides to tell Faith the truth, and that starts with going back in time a little bit. That's right, the whole plot of this game is a flashback explained by Jack to Faith in this diner. A news team is reporting outside of a news company skyscraper in Grant City. A group of bad boys has taken this building hostage, and they haven't really made any public demands. They just sort of interrupted a live broadcast that was ironically addressing the rise of crime in the city. Jack arrives on the scene and shoulder checks the fuck out of the reporter on his way up to the building, which she doesn't appreciate too much. What the hell? Excuse me, do you know who I am? Before walking up to the officer in charge and not treating him much better. He essentially calls the negotiating officer shit at his job, and as he's picking apart his piss poor strategy, a hostage gets tossed from the roof, and Jack decides he's just gonna get in there and stop them himself. The commanding officer tries to stop Jack, saying that he'll have his badge and his gun for this, and Jack, being the loose cannon that he is, gives it to him in a very dramatic fashion anyway. Here, you point it in that direction and you pull this to make it go bang. Feel free to point it at a bad guy if you ever end up facing one. So Jack walks into this building unarmed, but we all know that's not a problem. The first waves of enemies are all unarmed as well, allowing him to wet his knuckles a little bit with their blood, before reaching a security guard who lets you access a private elevator and then watching another elevator full of innocent people fall 90 something stories to their deaths. In his ride up to the top, Jack sees the news report saying that the people he's fighting here are part of the dock workers union, but he calls bullshit as they aren't nearly organized enough to pull this off. After clearing the whole floor of bad guys with guns, eventually Jack makes it out to a rooftop area where he saves a woman who can give him access to the penthouse and get to the bottom, or the top, of this terrorist attack. From here, Jack gets a name on the radio that the union members were using, a leader of this attack named Riggs. As he gets to the top floor, he rescues some security guards being held hostage, and unlike the police commander down below in the streets, they pick up some guns and start helping Jack clear the floor. Eventually, Jack runs into Riggs, who blows a hole into the side of the building in order to escape, which leads to a foot chase along the rooftop of the skyscraper. Reaching the top at the helipad, a military gunship arrives to scoop up Riggs, and he flies away releasing a bird as he goes, confirming to Jack that he is indeed not Union. But the Union is the only lead that Jack has at this point, so that's where he's off to next. But not before he gets reprimanded by the same wimpy cop doing interrogations at the news building. Captain Aness is his name. Jack clearly does not give a fuck, but it's kind of clear that no one gives a fuck about Aness or even respects him as the captain of the SWAT team named Redwater just walks in and interrupts this meeting. You asshole. Whoa, whoa, what did you call me? Called you an asshole. Hey, Jack. Pretty much just starting a new conversation with Jack, trying to recruit him to the SWAT team. After this brief convo, Jack's dad, Frank, swoops in and takes him up to his appointment, a boxing session between the two of them. This is just a glorified fighting combo tutorial, but also a moment to show how close Jack and his father are. I brought you up right, and you made a right call just to prove it. You won't find me anything but proud. After their sparring session, Frank decides he's going to join Jack on his trip down to the docks to get some intel on the Union. He's interested in the case, and particularly the military guy leading them. They reach the lock gate and decide to have Shadow take the lead through the area and retrieve some keys for them. So Shadow murders about a dozen dudes and brings back the key card so the duo can just stroll on in. There are still plenty of bad guys hanging around, but Frank decides there will be no shooting. So luckily, the enemies follow close instructions as well, and there's just fisty cuffs ahead as as they explore. They find some evidence of blueprints and training areas for the news building, showing that they practiced and coordinated this attack, again, not something that the Union would typically do or be organized enough to do. Eventually, Frank, Jack, and Shadow get the drop on two Union guys, and instead of immediately killing them, they decide to try to get some information. But before they talk, the SWAT team led by Redwater shows up and kills them ending any attempts at interrogating any of the rest of the Union as well, so a full-on shootout takes place. Frank blows up on Redwater, telling him he's out of line. Redwater said that he was just trying to help as two guys and a dog weren't enough firepower to take down the Union, but now he fucked the situation up as there's no way for Frank and Jack to get a lead now. 
After the shootout, they decide to head deeper into the shipyard and see what they can find. And soon enough, they run into Riggs himself and a Triad member talking. So now it's more than just the Union. Riggs spots them and runs off, with the Triad named the Black Hand running in the other direction. Frank and Shadow chase after Riggs while Jack runs after the Triad. As soon as Jack corners and arrests the Triad, he discovers that his dad is there as well and he's shot in the chest. And this is by far the best acted scene in the entire franchise. And one of the best scenes in general. I can't stop the bleeding. I can't. I can't. I need help. Help! Help! Oh God! No! Hold on. Hold on. Dad, come on. Dad, just stay with me. Stay with me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Focus on me. Look at me. They're coming. They're, they're coming. They're coming. Just stay. Oh God, no! Stay with me. They'll be here any second. They'll be here any second. Just... Jesus Christ, where are they? Dad, hold on! As he realizes his dad is dead, he rampages on the Black Hand, trying to get information, but also just taking out his grief and anger in this moment. And after Faith talks some sense into him before he kills the Triad, he walks off to find some answers, with Shadow following behind after saying some final goodbyes to Frank. Jack's next lead is the triad leader named Sang, to see why they are meeting with Riggs. As Jack shows up to Chinatown, cops are already here, probably due to Frank's death, and they aren't exactly faring too well against the home team. It's a full-on war in the streets, automatic gunfire, rocket launchers, the works. He fights his way into the warehouse where Sang is, and he finds him executing some cops while sniffing coke all at the same time, and that's some true expertise right there. And the signs that this guy is entirely off of his rocker. Jack kills a couple of thugs, but his sights are set on Sang, and he ends up chasing him out to the top of a moving train. This next section is a timed area where you run from train car to train car against a timer, and you have to not only fight waves of thugs, but also disarm bombs on the way to Sang. But instead of finding the leader, he finds a stack of explosives that take him and the train off the rails, knocking Jack out. So now you control Shadow as he makes his way across the train yard to save Jack. Even though once you get to him, he just drags him two feet back from the falling debris and this is enough to wake Jack up, I guess. Anyway, so now the two of them continue the pursuit of Sang, heading to Grant Central Station, a clever remix of the famous NYC terminal. Sang is planning to blow the place up, so again, it's another race against the bomb timer mission. But soon enough, Jack gets Sang cornered. Sang isn't an easy target by any means, though, and thoroughly fucks Jack up in his attempt to take him down. You can not kill me, Mr. Policeman. <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Jack is forced to take him out by throwing him onto the train tracks like a finisher move in Def Jam Fight for New York. This means Jack saved Grant Central, but also means that he has no more intel on Riggs. All he knows at this point is Riggs paid both the Union and the Triads to tear the city apart. The Union attempted to take the news station, and the Triads attempted to take out the main subway hub. Luckily, Jack stopped them both. In order to find out where Riggs is doing this though, Jack has to go back to the docks where his dad died to see what Riggs was shipping there. Jack arrives at the pool of blood left by his father, right next to the entrance of the docks that he intends to search. Yet another shadow stealth mission to get the gate key here? But soon enough, Jack is in to explore as well, and he finds the blueprints to Riggs' entire plan here. He finds pictures of his enforcers, but also the SWAT captain Redwater, and photos of the stadium project going on in the city. But most importantly, he finds a voice recording of Julian Temple and Riggs planning this whole thing, even confirming that Redwater is involved too. Julian Temple, of course, being the guy that Riggs was pretending to torture in the penthouse of the news building. It was all a ruse, all set up by Temple to make him look good, like someone who acts strong in the face of a terrorist. Jack decides to explore the docks a little bit more and he finds some advanced military gear, labeled as property of Grant City PD, but a department Jack does and recognize, GAC, or Grant City Anti-Crime, a not so welcome reappearance from the first game. Jack even makes fun of the acronym as it doesn't really make too much sense. GAC, Grant City Anti-Crime. 
Should have been GCAC, I guess, but that wouldn't roll off the tongue quite as well. This also means that GAC troops become the newest enemy for Jack and Shadow in the game, so no more easy street with dock workers and triad members. Jack fights his way into the sewer system of Grand City while battling the pseudo-military force that is GAC, until eventually he reaches the stadium construction project that has become the new base for this anti-crime task force. You learn through some exposition that the stadium was funded by a man named William Pinnacle, a guy who had big visions for Grant City and wanted the stadium to bring more money to the city. He also was a candidate for mayor at some point, but he ended up in prison, so no one picked up the tab for the stadium construction. This is another nod to the original game's plots, or kind of an alternate history in the way that the plot points kind of diverged in the two games. Jack fights long and hard to get up into the stadium, facing some crazy new enemies and a lot of them. The GAC tank was pretty freaking cool, and I just really like the design that they did with the GAC units overall this go around. As Jack gets to the center of the base, he finds Temple on the news broadcast revealing his strategy. Cause chaos in order to get emergency power to fix it, and then take that power and run with it. Temple caused the tower takeover and the train station bombs, and now he's using those excuses to deploy his GAC military on the city and reign over it. Once Riggs hears this broadcast, he knows that he's in the clear and he no longer needs the help from the criminal scum like the dock workers in the triad so he immediately kills them off. Jack decides he is a one man army as usual and continues to infiltrate their base and take out their resources starting with their gunships. Once he takes out about 50 soldiers and 3 helicopters he finally runs into Riggs who admits that he can't just fly away so it's time to fight one on one. And one on one means every piece of technology in the place and about a dozen more soldiers as well. The Riggs fight ends kind of unceremoniously. He just falls. No witty dialogue, no cutscene, bad guy just dead. Jack moves on to blow up the final gunship in the area before heading out, and as he places this final brick of explosives, he gets ambushed by none other than Redwater. He knocks Jack out and he flies away with him in the chopper. Redwater explains that he did what needed to be done to take out the scum in the city, even though as Jack points out, the scum was hired to cause chaos, and this is all manufactured. Also, Riggs is alive, I guess. I don't know what happened there, I guess that's just why his death was so cut and dry, he didn't actually die. Jack tries talking some sense into Redwater, telling him that Riggs is planning on killing him anyway, playing the voice recording from earlier, proving it. So before Riggs could react, Redwater stabs him in the chest and then tosses him out of the chopper. Jack grabs him as he falls, but this causes him just to fall to the ground with him as well. Redwater tosses the explosives that Jack said earlier before flying away, leaving Jack in a dead Riggs on the helipad. At least, I think Riggs is actually dead this time. This brings us back to present day, or at least to where Jack is in the diner telling his tale to Faith. After this run-in with Redwater and Riggs, he got into a tugboat and landed on the docks and crawled his way to the diner with the help of Shadow clearing the way. In their discussion, it's made clear that Faith meeting him here was a setup. Redwater convinced Faith that Jack was off the deep end because his dad died. Jack doesn't hold this against her though. She had no way to know the truth. Redwater is a police officer officer after all. So now she decides to help Jack get back at Temple and Redwater. Faith calls in an EMT helicopter to meet her on the roof and fly Jack right up to Temple's penthouse from the first level in the game. But before she can complete the call, she gets sniped through the window. I guess that EMT chopper is actually needed now. Gak storms the place and Jack has to juggle hitting them in waves while dragging Faith's body to the medevac. Which, I mean, I'll take this over an escort mission. Once they make it up to the rooftop, the chopper starts to leave because Gak opens up minigun fire on them. Understandably, of course, unless you're Jack Slate, who has no time for fear of bullets. I need that medevac to land, now! It is trying to land, but has been fired upon. I'll love. take care of that! Just keep the bird in the air, and I'll let you know when it's clear to land. <laughs> Jack clears the way and allows the chopper to land safely. He loads up Faith and then hops in himself, dropping her off at the hospital and then asks the pilot for a favor bringing him to Temple's penthouse. Jack storms the gak infested tower from the beginning of the game and rushes towards Temple's penthouse. And once he reaches him, Temple tries to play the victim again, thinking that Jack has no idea that he's the mastermind behind all this. Jack and Shadow clearly aren't playing any games, but Jack doesn't know the whole truth. Jack thinks that Temple ordered Riggs to kill his father, but actually, he says that was never in the plan. Redwater killed Frank Slate, and now Redwater has also killed Riggs, and now he's after Temple. He's taking over the whole operation like it's his own. 
Jack loses his shit, learning that Redwater killed his dad. But he channels the good cop his father was and decides not to kill Temple, but to arrest him instead. And once he learns the location of Redwater from him, he has his eyes set on him, on an island called Danvers Island. Arresting Temple is not as easy as it sounds, as Gak have once again swarmed the Temple Towers. But even once they clear that and they get to the precinct, that too is overrun by Gak enforcers. Jack eventually makes it to the holding cells and Temple stays alive, somehow too, even after Jack uses him as a literal bullet shield for the last half an hour. Captain Ines is near the cells as well and Jack sort of makes up with him with their differences. Ines is kind of the only ally that he has left at this point, so better to make friends now than never. And Ness and the rest of the police force left alive decide to fight back against Redwater and the Gax attempt to take over the city. They fight their way for control over the precinct, with the help of Jack and Shadow of course, and eventually they take it back. Gak units are ordered to retreat back to Danvers Island by Redwater once they lose control of this precinct, and Jack comes up with a plan to get into the island unnoticed. He puts on one of the Gak uniforms of a fallen soldier and he hops on the extraction gunship telling Ines to meet him at the island when he gives a vague, loud signal. And he also tells him to bring Shadow. Jack stays in disguise, making it to a meeting with Redwater where he chews out the Gak squad, bitching about how one guy and his dog is overthrowing this whole operation. The whole place is full of people just talking shit about Slate, calling him a tough son of a bitch, but also saying they want to kill him as soon as possible. I believe it's Slate still in one piece. He's a tough son of a bitch, I'll give him that. I heard his dog will rip your head off. Yeah, and piss on you like you're a fucking lamppost. Once Jack meanders over to the armory though and he grabs a gun, he starts an assault on the base, using a grenade launcher to signal a nest to move in with the GCPD. This is another long and drawn out gunfight at the base, until Jack runs into some new tech that he decides he wants to use, one of those fancy Gak tank suits. Jack guns down dozens of dudes in his fancy new power armor all while arguing with Redwater over the comms. Redwater saying that he did what he had to do. He killed Frank because he got close to the Gak project and he would have never gotten on board with it. Gak needed to happen for the city and Frank was just in the way. Jack eventually ditches the tank suit and makes his way on foot to Redwater, where he's hiding in the lighthouse on the island. He's about to take Jack out with the turret, but Shadow gets the drop on him and attacks. Redwater fights him off though and kicks him to the ground, hurting him pretty bad. Bad move on his part though, he killed Jack's dad and he shot Jack's girlfriend, but you never kick a man's dog. Jack goes on to the top of the lighthouse and kicks Red's ass, and in an act of defiance, Red smugly tells Jack that he knew he wasn't going to arrest him, as Jack plunges a knife into his chest and he falls into the ocean. Even though after killing like 500 dudes in the past 24 hours, I don't think Jack is too worried about one more guy not ending up in the prison system. Shadow hobbles up to Jack with his whittle hurt paw, and the game ends here. There is a cutscene after this of Frank's funeral, and he's awarded the medal of honor posthumously from the mayor and Jack and Faith make up again as well. Jack and Shadow say their final goodbyes to Frank and then the credits actually roll. Death to Rights Retribution is by far the best entry into the franchise, but unfortunately that wasn't really a high bar to beat, as the game still isn't that good. It's not bad, but considering the time period when it came out, surrounded by the likes of Red Dead Redemption, Fallout New Vegas, Alan Wake, and Bioshock 2, and several other greatest of all time caliber games, Retribution was too little too late for the series. The game got mixed reviews from critics and players alike, and the general consensus was that the game was fun, but it felt like a title released in 2007 rather than 2010. And in those days, three years made the world of difference when it came to advancements in game tech. Retribution is the last time that we've seen a dead to rights game. And although there is always the chance that Jack Slate and Shadow would make a return to the gaming sphere, I don't see that happening anytime soon. There isn't many people swooning over this series like others that have been abandoned for years. There are fans with fond memories of the games, but the demand for a reboot or reappearance of Jack Slate just isn't there. Namco hasn't been doing much in video games for the past few years though, so who knows? Maybe revamping old IPs will be their next course of action for the company. I for one am happy that I played all the games this year. I had some fond memories replaying the first one. The second one wasn't great, I don't want to revisit that one ever again, but this one actually was quite a bit of fun. 
it's not the greatest game ever made, but it's definitely not the worst game ever made. It's like solid middle of the road fun shoot 'em up. And I think that there's a lot of promise for the franchise if they do ever decide to reboot it. And if they do, I'd be first in line to get a copy and play it with a smile on my face. As long as it's not some crazy multiplayer DLC cosmetic skin bullshit. Dead to Rights is one of those series that has good ideas and some memorable moments, but overall, it isn't one of the best in its weight class. Jack Slate and Shadow go down in history as one of the most iconic duos in gaming, but when you take the time to reflect and analyze each game for what they were, none of them were really that great. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed my time with some of the titles, mainly One and Retribution, but I can't lie to you or myself and say that these games were fantastic. And the others in the series, Two and Reckoning, were pretty bad, all things considered. If I had to toss them all into a tier list, I'd give One a B, the Game Boy Advance port being an F, Two a C, Reckoning a D, and Retribution the best of the bunch, making it into A class. There are certainly worse games out there to play, but there are probably a greater number of better games out there as well which is really quite sad because i remember having a lot of fun with this series back in the day uh, i think the idea of just some rogue detective and his brutal ass malamute dog killing people for fun just kind of like a was a fun concept but looking back the games just really weren't that good with that being said i hope you enjoyed this retrospective look at dead to rights and if you felt that the games deserved better reviews and praise please let me know why you feel that way in the comments as i am genuinely curious. I do have a soft spot for Reckoning in my heart because that story was just bonkers and I <laughs> still reading back <laughs> What I wrote about the story plot still makes me laugh really hard. It was a great story. I gotta, I gotta give Rebellion the writing props on that game. Anyways, thank you for tuning in. I'd like to give a special shout out to the supporters on Patreon and the YouTube members. Doc Schwinn, Kid Kingpin, Snowflake, Zachary Parkerson, Not Much, Anonymous Starkweather, Crash Bandicoot 25, Ben Stevens, Potty, Yay Man, Alfred Correa, Kenneth Butler, Ethan Carpenter, Matthew Taylor, Scribe Slendy, Nick the Brosa, Nico Mendez, Dylan Clink, Frankie Hammer, Peanut So Holland, Grizzly Wizzly, Sexy Pickles, Forge em Nas, Mike Easton, and Shotgun Minister. Thank you all for the support. Sorry for taking three months off of releasing videos, and I hope to see you back here very soon for the next video. And if you tuned in this long, I'll just let you know, it's going to be a massive retrospective video on GTA Vice City. So, see you soon. Peace.